Speaking of up tempo, that's exactly what we saw from Rhett Lashley's Miami Hurricanes offense. Derek King comes in, Rhett Lashley comes in, and the Hurricanes, uh, when they got rolling, uh, they could hit those big plays. They would just uh, kind of kind of wear you down, just snap, hustle, hustle to the line, snap, hustle line, snap. And sometimes it wasn't even consistent, but then it would spring the home run play and, and things would seem to work out. Now, the, the issues we've talked about a lot on here, it's a, a group of wide receivers in particular where it really kind of felt like there was no consistency and at times let Derek King down. Brevin Jordan, fantastic. He's gone. Uh, but, you know, Mike Harley, he- hello, let's go. Like, let's, let's, let's get you playing. Let's get you to be a leader in this room. Charleston Rambo also joins that wide receiver room transfer from Oklahoma. Defensively, things get a little bit interesting because Jalen Phillips, uh, the transfer from UCLA was fantastic. Uh, you know, Quincy Roche from Temple uh, coming in on, that was a good like pass rushing duo. And so Jafari Harvey has an opportunity to, to step up and be another difference maker, but six year Zach McLeod, is going to be moving from linebacker to defensive end. He was a team captain a year ago. He's, you don't like Zach McLeod? No, I do. I just, uh, I, I don't know. I'm not sold on, on coming back for a sixth year and playing D end. Okay. Bubba Bolden also in the mix. Tyreek Stevenson comes in from Georgia. Uh, the in, most interesting thing for me about Miami right now, uh, especially in spring, is its defense. Uh, Blake Baker left to go take a job on the LSU staff. So Manny Diaz now has put his hands on the play sheet. He's going to be calling the plays. And some Hurricanes fans have alleged, and I don't. I would need to really do a deep dive uh, before I, I feel strongly saying this, but that the Miami defense has taken some steps back uh, in the last couple of years. So it will be interesting this spring to see how the personnel shakes out defensively, what we think the impact of Manny Diaz taking over the play calling, which we won't know to the fall, see what that is because the Derek King and trying to make this offense go, those, those seem to be pieces that we're just not going to know until King tries to work his way back into full health for fall camp, which as of right now, he is scheduled to do. So for, for Miami, like the where, where are you identifying as the biggest concerns for the hurricanes in trying to be able to take uh, an, another year where you're coming into it, you're looking at Miami and you're thinking, are you going to contend for an ACC championship? But what happened in their two biggest games of the year against conference opponents? I mean, they were just outclassed, Clemson and North Carolina. So what, what are the keys to closing the gap with Clemson and North Carolina? I think that we're going to need to see – like this. if you look at Connolly's returning production rating, rankings, this is a team with one of the – you know, I think they were ranked third, and they're, they're definitely the most on offense. I think they were 10th or 11th on defense, even with like the Jalen Phillips, you know, moving on. So I, I, I think that – you do need, I think Jalen Phillips is still a pretty big loss because I do think he was a key part of that defense. And I know Gregory Rousseau is gone, but I feel like that doesn't really matter because he didn't play last year anyway. So I think I'd like to see a little bit better play from the linebacker spot for Miami going in, into 2021. I thought that was some, it wasn't horrible, but there were just some moments there where I was like, eh, I don't know. And I think offensively, I know Derek King is not practicing this spring, obviously, but I am interested in watching the quarterbacks that Miami does have this spring, because if King isn't 100% at the start of the season in the fall, or if he's missing time going into the summer and he's not really getting prepared, like Miami's not in a position with its schedule where it can afford to, you know, be anything less than hundred percent to start the season. Cause they opened the year with Alabama. And then even after the Alabama game, they're still getting an app state team that has been one of the better programs in the power five. And then you follow that up with Michigan state, which is a program that is not the Michigan state of five, six years ago, but is still a solid big 10 team. So that's a really tough opening to your schedule. So if Derek King's not at hundred percent, you're going to need, you might need, whether it's Jake Garcia or or, uh, what's the other kid's name, Tyler Van Dyke you might need one of those guys to be ready for the start of the year to be your quarterback in some really big games for the Canes. So I think if you look at a talent wise, this roster from a talent wise position, it's up there with North Carolina as the best team in the coastal. I think if Derek King is a hundred percent, it's right up there with North Carolina, but that King question is what kind of puts a cloud over this for me and just leaves some question marks as to how good Miami can be in 2021. Cause if he's not a hundred percent, I could see them getting off to a really rough start to the season 
And is that one of those situations where we've seen with Miami in the recent past? And I, I know it's a different coaching staff and it's different players, but it's hard to get it out. If they get off to a slow start, do they kind of just pack it in? Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's a good question, right? They used to have, back when Florida State used to beat Miami, uh, they used to have this thing where after they lost Florida State, they would just absolutely crater. It was pretty much an annual thing. Um, Tom, I agree with you. I think their linebacker play has got to be a lot better. If you look at, at Bill Connolly's stuff on them, I mean, 103rd in rushing explosiveness allowed, 94th in, in rushing marginal efficiency allowed. Their pass defense really wasn't that bad. They they allowed more short stuff, I think, than their fans would probably prefer, but mm -hmm. they really didn't allow the deep ball that much, which also I think fits with what you're saying about how they their linebackers and pass coverage uh, were, were not all that good. But I, I think that they had problems last year staying in gaps, and they didn't tackle all that well. Um, Got to get guys on, on the ground so that you're not allowing these explosive runs. I mean, it, to me, a team with Miami speed should never be 103rd in the nation in rushing explosiveness allowed. Like, that is too many long runs just out the gate. And I know a, a decent part of that is probably the North Carolina game, but yeah. Bill does shut these numbers off after gar after garbage time hits. So a couple of those runs when, when North Carolina was making like 100 nothing, those don't really count in this. On the flip side of things, I, I kind of have a couple questions. Chip hit on one. Uh, and I do think, by the way, this Miami team absolutely should be considered one of the, the major favorites to win the Coastal. Like they are kind of 1B to, to 1, 1A for, for UNC, for me. I, I don't think it's necessarily clear like one, two. They return basically everybody on the offensive line. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. That offensive line did not open holes very well last year. Mm. I think when they were able to run the football, a lot of it was because of motion and action, tempo, and teams paying a lot of attention to Derek King. And they were able to hit explosive runs, but they were a very bad team as far as staying ahead of the chains with the run game. I mean, you're talking about – this is a pretty wild split. So they were 95th in rushing success rate and 24th in rushing explosiveness. So on a down to down basis, two that yards, run game sucks. Two yards, one yard, like stop behind the line of scrimmage, 30 yards. Right. <laughs> there's, there's a Herman Boone quote on this, I'm sure. You know, just, just keep doing it. It's like Novocaine, it always works. <laughs> Except for the fact that Miami was too often putting itself in bad down and distance situations. And this offense, from a passing standpoint, you know, go back to what Gus does. Like we know what Rhett does. I think Rhett's a good offensive coordinator, but this is based on it's a play action style passing game using tempo, trying to set up simplistic coverages from the defense because of the tempo, because you're trying to keep everybody confused that way and, and hurried up. But too often they were finding themselves in second and nine, second and eight. And guess what? Play action doesn't work quite as well if the defense doesn't actually believe you're going to hand it off or they don't care if you're going to hand it off. And De'Ara King, look, he's a good college quarterback when you take the sum of his talents into consideration, in my opinion. But just as a pure dropback passer, he's not great. He's okay. Mm -hmm. He doesn't suck. But he's not great as a pure dropback passer. So I think too often this team found itself in, in passing downs, and it is a team that has to stay ahead of the chains because that's where its explosive plays came to. If you look at that breakdown, a lot of that was, you know, they, they, they'd get like second and five when they did get them. And then they would hit people with play action over the top, uh, off the top using that tempo. Uh, Chip, to your point, by the way, about the receivers, man, I know I'm rambling here. Uh, yards per target, Mike Harley, 9.4. You know what? For number one, that's not great, but it's not horrendous. Mark Pope, 6.6. D. Wiggins, 6.2. That is like walk-on level. That's terrible. Six six point six, six point two. That that can't play. And drop percentages, by the way, double digits for both of them. Uh, yeah. Anecdotally, I've got Mark Pope wide open on a wheel route, dropping it like should be touchdown, like just right off the top. That is the first uh, college football top shot highlight that comes up in my mind right now. Yeah, that's. Oh. Oof. Going back to the offensive line point you were making, but like I just looked it up, football outsiders <clears throat> line yards last year, Miami's offensive line ranked 99th opportunity rate. It ranked 89th stuff rate. It ranked 94th. It was like, it's kind of what you were just saying. They were not doing a very good job of putting them in positions to succeed and put together drives, but they beat the teams they should beat. It wasn't always pretty, but when they weren't playing Clemson or North Carolina, they, they found ways to do it. The Virginia game was absolutely ugly. Pitt game was ugly. Virginia Tech was ugly. But they won, right? Yeah, but I think they're that, a good like, team. 
They're a good, yeah, exactly. They're a good team and they're beating the teams that they should beat. But I think if you're a Miami fan, you want to start seeing them not just beat the teams they should beat, but destroy the teams they should beat. And once in a while, beat a team that you shouldn't. Did Lou Headley go pro, their punter? I don't know. Burr, um, I mean, he's like 39 years old, so. Well, they, they were number one in punt efficiency by a mile. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious if, if he is back. Um, <laughs> Does he, will, will he go pro or will he just retire? <laughs> I, he, like their, their punt efficiency is, is off the charts. Like he averaged 47.2 yards per punt. Only, only one in eight punts were even returned. And for an average of only 7.4 yards, like Pretty his easy. net average was 45. That is incredible. <laughs> like he was probably snap for snap, the best player in their team by a lot last year, including Derek. Um, <laughs> Give the punter some best player for Miami on a snap by snap basis. No one's having more success than Lou Headley. Do you think their receivers can develop over the summer without Derek? Like that's kind of a question I have, right? Like I, I think he'll be healthy for the season based on what I've been, been reading and hearing at inside the, you know, inside the U and whatnot. But man, I, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm kind of curious about the receiver development. Well, the quarter, the reason uh, I wrote a piece for CBS sports.com, just talking about ACC random spring thoughts. And the, the reason, one of the things I mentioned for the quarterback two battle is Derek King's had two knee injuries in three years, you know, like any, like you, it might not, not, I'm not wishing or thinking any kind of injury for Derek King, but any tweak, any twist, anything, you're going to be like very cautious and you're going to take him out of the game. So whoever is that QB2 at Miami, you might find yourself where it's middle of the third quarter and you're stepping into uh, a game with ACC Coastal Division Championship contention all hanging in the balance and you got to be ready to go. So I like, I'm not, I'm not putting the injury prone tag on Derek King, but I can't look at two knee injuries, both to the right knee in a three year span and not think that the QB two is going to be very important. If Miami is going to be able to contend for the coastal division title. Headley is staying by the way, according to Coca. Shout out Coca and shout out to Miami hurricanes.